This is Radio TV Phono Nut, and a few days ago on the record player group on Facebook, somebody somebody posted about a little RCA portable from about 1960 that uses the standard four-speed alliance drive mechanism, and from the way it sounded, they were new to record player servicing and wanted to know how to fix their mechanism, and I gave them a written rundown, but just to... uh. Just to maybe make things a little clearer for them, I thought I'd do a video that'll show you how to service your Alliance phono drive mechanism, and maybe this will help some other people too. Back in the days of United States made record players, and this dates back to the 78 RPM only era, there were two major players that made phono drive mechanisms, Alliance and General Industries. And this same basic alliance mechanism was used from from about 1953-54 up until the mid-70s when Alliance stopped making phono drive mechanisms and the only American company left at that time was General Industries. And I don't know how long they held out. I think they held out sometime until the 90s, but the earlier alliance mechanism is three speed and then they added a the 16 rpm speed sometime around 56 57 somewhere around in there but the mechanisms are basically the same between the two all right so first we'll go over some of the things you'll need you'll need your common hand tool tools to include phillips and flathead screwdrivers needle nose pliers some of these little smaller flathead screwdrivers like this. Oftentimes you'll need a quarter inch nut driver and sometimes a five sixteenths nut driver to get the motor apart. And as far as cleaning and lubricant, at least 91% rubbing alcohol that you can get anywhere. We can even get that in my hometown, believe it or not. Uh, some non-detergent lightweight motor oil such as this this is basically zoom spout is what this is or the blue 3-in-1 electric motor oil will work that can usually be purchased locally unless you live in my town then you have to mail order it about the only thing available in my town besides the rubbing alcohol is uh, alcohol that you drink in smartphones. We have an abundant supply of that here. Alright, we need some lubricant. And this is what's left of my phono lube. They don't make this stuff anymore, but white lithium grease will also work. And a can of contact cleaner will also come in handy. You can use the same stuff you use to clean your volume controls with, or that's what I use. And although not entirely necessary, but it helps to have some of this. This is a product called Rubber Renew. We use this for cleaning the surface of the idler wheel. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, this stuff is very toxic, and it's very unpleasant to smell. So I would advise using this outdoors. And this particular record player is a Califone classroom model from 1959. I've had this for years, and I think I've already overhauled the amplifier, and I think I did just enough to the drive mechanism to get it to run, but I pulled it out of storage here a couple of days ago, and I plugged it in, and it seems that the motor is seized up, so this is going to get a full overhaul today. I will say one thing about the amplifier in this set. It uses a series string amp with a solid state rectifier diode and two tubes and series. Now they had a three wire power cord on here that appeared to be from the factory. That's really not a good idea to have a three wire power cord on a chassis that doesn't have a power transformer. If plugged in an outlet that's wired the right way, there's no problem. And let me add that there is an isolation capacitor wired between the chassis where the ground lug of the power uh, cord connects to and B minus circuit ground but still it's not a good idea 
to have a three wire cord on a situation like this. When plugged to an outlet that's wired correctly, it's not a problem, but if you plug it in an outlet where the neutral and hot is reversed, you're going to get a loud hum that sounds like a bad filter capacitor. So what I may end up doing with this, right now I just have a two wire cord on it. I may eventually wire an isolation transformer inside the case and go back to a three wire cord, but we're not going to worry about that today. And on another note, we have a local Remember When page on Facebook, and people, as you probably expect, post a lot of pictures from their school days around here. Well, somebody posted a picture of the same elementary school that I attended in the 80s of their fourth grade class back in 1965, and on the shelf I can see a record player just like this one. Now, of course, these were pretty common back in the 60s, but they're not so common today. They were dumped and replaced a long time ago. I tried to get some old record players from my school district a while back, and I pretty much got the brush off and was told that, well, yeah, we still have some here, but there's no way you can get them, even though we're not using them. You know, all that kind of stuff gets turned over to an electronics recycler where it's destroyed, but we can't let you have it because taxpayer money paid for it, and we just can't let you have it. Yeah, well, I don't think that those record players are so old. They've about depreciated themselves to death anyway, and I don't think anybody would care one way or another if they gave them to me or sold them to me or anything else. All right, anyway, enough about that. The first thing we need to do is remove our turntable platter and it's a metal platter and you want to put your speed selector in neutral usually the alliance mechanisms that neutral position is past the 78 speed if it's not just set the speed lever between 33 and 45 to disengage the idler wheel and if you look here on the turntable platter you'll see an E clip that's on the spindle here that's what keeps the platter from falling off as the record player is being transported. We want to very carefully take our small flat blade screwdriver and pry this clip off. And be very careful and try to hold on to it and make sure it doesn't fly across the room. And we have our clip removed and on some models there's a washer under the clip. And if a washer is present you want to lift that off too and keep up with it. Now we should be able to grasp the turntable by the edges and lift it off. And a lot of times they won't lift off easy. If it doesn't, just tap the spindle a few times with a rubber mallet or the butt end of a screwdriver. And then it should just come off with ultimate ease. Just do it like this. This is a rubber handled screwdriver. Here we are with the platter removed, and this will give you an idea of what an alliance mechanism looks like. And right here it even says Alliance Genie, so that's a pretty good clue right there. Alright, the next thing we want to do is take a paper towel and dampen it in rubbing alcohol and clean the inner rim of this turntable platter. If you look there, you can see where the idler wheel, where the driving surface is there, and we want to clean that up. Okay, we got some crud off the uh, inner rim of the turntable platter. And the next thing I want to do is address this center spindle here. And in order to do that, as well as service the motor, we're going to have to lift the motor board. And on this particular record player, it's held in place by some Phillips head screws along the uh, perimeter here. Most record players are attached the same way. Some of them have the screws around the side here, but you get the idea. Now, generally, the symptoms of defective lubricant or dried out lubricant on the uh, turntable spindle is if the lubricant dries out and turns to powder, the turntable will be all wobbly and jerky as it rotates. And if the turntable, if the lubricant gets all gunked up, the spindle will be very hard to turn. I've seen some that were so stiff you couldn't even turn them at all. So let's get the motor board up so we can get to the underside. 
And before I continue, a few other helpful hints. Have you some kind of tray to put all of your screws and hardware in and have a clutter-free workspace. My workbench is not an example of a clutter-free workspace, but I try to be careful and try to work in an environment where there's not going to be children and pets monkeying around your workspace that might disturb all of your little parts because if you lose any of those you're gonna it's gonna complicate things a lot more than they need to be and it's also a good idea to make sure your tone arm is secured to the rest so it won't be flopping around while you're working on it and in the case of these school record players with the plug-in 89T cartridge, you might want to unplug it and sit it to the side just uh, in case the tone arm comes loose and flops around. You won't damage the cartridge. Back in the day, those cartridges were about five and some chains a p change a piece, and they were readily available. Today, unless you find a good deal, they're about 25 a piece and not so readily available anymore. So you want to take care not to ruin the one you've got. Here's the amp. I've done a little work to it, but obviously I didn't fully overhaul it. I replaced a couple of AC safety capacitors, one between B- minus circuit ground and the chassis, and another one between the negative side of the, of the uh, cartridge and the chassis. Still has the original pyramid filter capacitor in it. I'll check it, but there's no hum, so heck, I may just leave it alone. And this is a 1959 model. That white thing you see directly in front of you, that's the rectifier diode. Alright, let's get this spindle out. We're running out of time here. If you look here, you'll notice a clip that's holding the spindle in place. Sometimes it's the kind of clip you see here, and sometimes it's an E-clip. But whatever kind of clip it is, very carefully pry it off and don't let it fly away from you. Now sometimes when you once you get the clip off, sometimes once you remove the clip, there will be a small thin washer under the clip. You, if one's present, you want to make sure not to lose it. On this particular one, there was no washer directly below the clip, which is no surprise. Some have it, some don't. But there's generally always a washer at the other end of the spindle here, as you can see in the video and you want to make sure not to lose that. Now we'll take our paper towel, moistened with rubbing alcohol, clean the heck out of this spindle where it goes down into the rest of the mechanism, and then we'll take a Q-tip, or take several Q-tips, moistened with alcohol, and clean this hole out right here where the uh, spindle originally mounted. And you'll get all kind of black gunk out of it, most likely. Alright, we got all of the old gunk cleaned off of the spindle and from inside the hole where the spindle goes. Now we'll take our phono lube and coat this spindle with phono lube. And then in addition to that, I like to take a bit of this zoom spout oil and mix in with the phono lube to kind of make it, kind of lets the spindle turn a little more freely. And then we'll put it back in the hole put the clip in place, wipe up any excess with a paper towel, and this spindle should be sufficiently lubricated. Okay, we have our phono lube and zoom spout mixture applied to the spindle, and I'll apply a little bit inside of the hole itself. Now we'll insert this back in, carefully reinstall the clip, wipe up any excess, and this phase of the uh, repair should be complete. Okay, the spindle's back in place, and it turns nice and smooth now. Now, next, we need to get rid of the, get the idler wheel removed so we can get to the mechanism. And the idler wheel is this, obviously, this big metal wheel with a rubber tire on it. And you see how this works. This motor shaft is stepped. This is our 78 portion, 45, 33, and the smallest diameter on top is 16. And whenever I shift the speed control lever, it places the idler wheel to the proper relationship on the uh, motor shaft to play the speed that's been selected. Now in order to remove this wheel, you have to very carefully pry off this clip here. 
and it's a tiny clip, so be careful not to lose it. And then below the clip, you'll notice some fiber washers. Uh, I don't know how many is there, but you need to carefully remove those and put them in a separate stack because whenever you lift off the wheel, you're going to find some more washers under the wheel, and you'll want to lift those off and put them in a separate stack because when you put it all back together, you want to put the washers back like they came off and the reason for those washers is to orient this wheel so whenever the uh, speed selector is placed on the desired speed this uh, this wheel will make contact on the appropriate notch on the uh, motor capstan like it's supposed to. Okay we have our clip removed and on this one there were four washers under the clip. Now we'll carefully lift off the wheel and be careful because there may be washers under here that are stuck to the underside of the wheel because of lubricant. That doesn't seem to be the case with this one, but it, it can happen. And there's the wheel off of there. Do we even have any washers under here? No, no, looks like we don't have any washers under the wheel on this particular one. Of course, when I put it all back together, I'll make sure the the wheel is in the correct position on the uh, motor capstan and if it's not we may have to rearrange some washers. Now there are some things that need to be addressed about this wheel but we're not going to do that right now. We're going to do everything else that needs to be done and then we'll wash our hands to get any lubricant off of them and then we'll let this wheel be the last thing we, uh, we address. Now we want to take our Q-tips and paper towel and clean as much of this as we can. All of this. Try to clean as much of the old grime and gunk and dirt and old lubricant out of there as possible. And that might take a little while. And you can see a small area I cleaned just for comparison. That'll kind of give you an idea what the what a clean surface looks like versus one that's got 60 years worth of grime and gunk on it. Right now I have this hose down with contact cleaner spray and we'll just get in with some paper towels and, and, and clean it up as best we can. Okay, I got it all pretty clean. I had to use my toxic rubber renew stuff to get some of the dried up grease off. It's another thing the stuff doubles for, but don't use the stuff around plastic and don't use it on any surface that has paint on it because it will take it off it will screw up plastic but to clean off stubborn metal it'll do fine okay one thing I'll mention before we go any further is these alliance mechanisms for whatever reason even after they're cleaned and lubricated they're not very easy to flip the speed lever is not very easy to flip with the idler wheel off and the turntable platter not installed however it seems like when the idler wheel is in place and the turntable platter is installed, they're a lot easier to flip, but when they get stuck, you can just give them a good good uh, hit, and they'll usually move. Alright, now let's move on with this. You'll notice right here there's a little clip, and we need to carefully remove that, and it looks like a washer under that that we don't want to lose. And then we want to slide this idler wheel arm. It does feel like it's kind of stiff, so I think all this needs to come out and be cleaned and lubricated. Okay, with a little finagling with a screwdriver, we got the clip off, but you want to be careful. You don't want to let the screwdriver slip and stab your finger. I've done that before. And now we should be able to do a little finagling and get this idle wheel arm to separate from this piece and then slide and then work this piece around and slide it off of this shaft then we'll clean the shaft very thoroughly this shaft here this shaft here that this piece slides on and we'll go ahead and clean the idler wheel shaft with the paper towel and damp, dampen with alcohol then we'll take a q-tip dipped in alcohol and clean out all these holes here on this on this piece here and then we'll oil it up with the zoom spout and put it back on there. Okay, we now have it separated and when doing this it's best to have your selector set to the 16 RPM speed. It makes it much easier for this to drop down. Now we just 
do a little for dangling. I'm going to need both hands for this and slide this little piece off. Then we'll clean all three of these shafts with the alcohol and a paper towel and use a Q-tip to get out in these two holes on this piece and clean that out. Now be careful not to stretch this idler wheel tension spring. Be careful not to lose it. And you can see we got some black gunk out of the holes here. So that was indeed dirty. Now we'll clean these shafts here with a paper towel moistened with alcohol. Now we'll take a clean Q-tip dipped in Zoom Spout Oil and just lightly coat this shaft here and this shaft here. And then I'll just stick my oil soaked Q-tip up in these holes on this little piece here and try to get this good and lubricated. Now we don't want to get it too lubricated. We don't want oil running out that might possibly get on the idler wheel surface later on. Alright, after doing a little finagling, I got this piece back on. Oh yes, and clean the bottom portion of this shaft with alcohol and a paper towel too, and then I'll put a light coating of oil on that as well. Okay, we have it back on. We'll now put our brass washer here and put our carefully put our clip back using the needle nose pliers to clip it back in place. Again, being very careful not to lose anything. Okay, next we're going to need the phono lube. If you'll look right here, you'll see a little dimple and you can see where it's scraped right here. That's normal. We want to put a slight amount of phono lube here. Put a little bit more phono lube in these holes. Put a slight bit on the sprocket. I guess that's what you'd call it. Sprocket teeth here. And then put a little bit on this track right here. Again, don't go crazy with it because we don't want the stuff to possibly get on a, the motor shaft, the uh, idler wheel surface, or the inner rim of the turntable. That's three places where you don't want any lubricant whatsoever. Okay, we have all that lubricated. Now comes the moment when we remove the motor and to perform this operation you'll need a quarter inch nut driver and a flathead screwdriver. And you want to be real careful not to lose any of these parts. These three rubber things are motor mounting grommets. We have a nut here, a washer under that, and there should be a smaller spacer under that. And under that spacer is another washer, and then a larger spacer. And then under here, you can see our larger spacers here. And then I think there's some lock washers on the end of each bolt here on the bottom side of the motor. This here is your stator assembly that has your coil on it. This is your bottom bushing assembly and this up here is your top bushing assembly. Now before you take this apart you want to make note of where the top of the motor is, the top of the stator assembly and you probably want to make a mark on the stator assembly here to show which side everything goes on. That's really not critical, but I like to do it anyway. With a magic marker, just put a scratch in it with your screwdriver. But you don't want to get this stator assembly flipped upside down when you put it back together, because if you do, the motor is going to run backwards. Now this motor, I can turn it by hand, but it's very gummy. I've seen some that were so frozen up that you couldn't even turn them at all. And it's usually this bottom bearing assembly here that's gummed up that keeps the thing from turning. Our bushing assembly, bushing, bearing, all the same thing in my book. Here's our quarter inch nut driver and I prefer the type that doesn't have the magnet in the end of it. That way you can fit the tool over the ends of the bolts without the magnet getting in the way. I'm just going to loosen these bolts but I'm not going to take them off completely. I'll do that by hand. So I won't lose anything. Now as you loosen the nuts from the top side, it's best to hold your fingers over the bolt so they won't fall out whenever you loosen the nuts completely off. And then gently lower the motor, being careful not to lose anything. Alright, here's the motor. I'm still holding the screws, the bolts, and you can see how it's arranged. You take the nuts off, then the washer's under the nuts, 
you drop the motor out very carefully you see small standoffs on each boat followed by another washer and followed by larger standoffs under that now what I like to do on this silver colored boat that has nothing to do with getting the motor apart I like to just put our washer back on there and just hand tighten the nut so we don't have to worry with that one and then all we got to do is get these spacers and washers and bolts out that hold the bearing assemblies in place okay just like that now we'll carefully lift off all the hardware on our bushing assembly end of the motor and then I'll tell you what to do next and you can see we have lock washers on the bolts sometimes they'll stay captive to the bushing assembly so you want to pay close attention to that okay ideally this bottom bushing assembly should just come off but if it doesn't come off very easily do not I repeat do not force it because that bushing is actually held in place by some little thin little brass fingers and if you go yanking on this bottom bushing assembly too hard it'll pull the bushing clean out of the bushing assembly and you'll never get it back in there when you get one that's stuck I like to just stick my soldering iron tip down in here as close to the shaft as I can get it good and hot that'll usually get the lubricant broke free and you can slide it off now we want to take an alcohol saturated q-tip clean out this bottom bushing assembly clean off this shaft here and then clean this top shaft off as best you can you're not going to get this bushing assembly off very easy because of this spring here that they use for building up the shaft diameter for 78 rpm alright the next thing I want to do is pop these old motor mounting grommets off they they could still be used if I was in a tight but they're starting to get old and hard and that's what they do and you just have to finagle them and get them out of the hole they're kind of cone shaped and it just so happens I have three brand new ones left I order these in packages of nine from antique electronics supply I usually order about four or five packs at a time because when you're fixing record players on a large scale or on a medium scale I don't know what you'd call large or medium but anyway I go through a lot of them okay there's all three of the mounting grommets in place like I've said they're a little tricky to get in you have to do a little poking and prodding to get them in there but if you're patient you can get all three of them in there and and then everything will fit just like it's supposed to alright I've cleaned the clean the uh, bottom bushing assembly of the motor as well as the bottom end of the shaft both of them had all kind of brown gunk on them did the same thing to the top end of the shaft and oiled it now let me show you here you see those little brass fingers there's six of them there and that's what I was talking about that holds the bushing in place and if it gets too gunked up and gets stuck to the motor shaft and you start pulling on this trying to get it apart you're going to pull that bushing clean out of there and you're not going to get it back at that point you're going to be looking for a motor off of a junk record player to get parts off of now you see there's some felt wicking that's around the uh, bushing there we want to saturate that with zoom spout oil and I want to put a few drops down in the hole where the bushing is itself I've already done the same thing to the top bushing and there we are good and saturated and now we're ready to put the motor back together and install it back into the drive mechanism okay I have all our spacers and washers placed back on and I'm holding the motor so that the bolts can't fall out and we'll very carefully put it back into our mechanism and then put the bolts and washers top side and kind of tighten them down by hand and then I'll show you what else to do and you can see how I'm doing this I'm holding the motor like this so the bolts can't fall out with one hand and very carefully placing a washer and a nut and just hand tightening them in place to hold everything in place so now nothing can't fall out now then we need to align the motor bearings and this shaft should spin freely but sometimes they don't because the motor bearings need to be aligned and the way we align the bearings is we tap on the mo motor like this with the butt end of a screwdriver and then tighten it down a little bit check make sure the shaft spins freely 
If it doesn't, just keep tapping and tightening and making sure the shaft spins freely by hand. And when you're tightening this, you probably want to place a flathead screwdriver on this side to keep the bolt from spinning. And then use your quarter inch nut driver on the top side that has the nuts on it and tighten it down. Very good. Tighten it down as tight as you can. Well, I know you're not going to believe this, but there's now light at the end of the tunnel as far as this mechanical restoration goes. Now, now would be a good time to wash your hands to get off any oil or grease deposits, and there's surely going to be some on there. And then we want to take a paper towel, dampen in alcohol, plug this up and turn it on just like it is, and make sure the motor spins, and if it does, take your dampened rag or paper towel and touch it up against this motor shaft to clean off any oil deposits that are surely going to be on there after fooling around with the motor with it apart and lubricating it. Alright, I'm not feeling any side to side play in the shaft which means the bushings are not worn. That's a good sign. Occasionally they are worn but and when that happens, you just have to find an old junk motor somewhere. Alright, it fired right up. It's spinning good. Has good spin down time. Alright, let's clean the shaft. Alright, we'll just clean the whole shaft just like this. We don't want to apply enough pressure to stop the motor, but we want to, and you see we're getting some gunk off of it. Alright, let's talk about the idler wheel for a minute. Technically, I should just go ahead and send this to the Voice of Music website and have it rebuilt, but there are some things I can do right now to make it work. Number one, I can treat it with rubber renew, the toxic stuff that I showed you a few minutes ago. And I can also put this in a drill, a hand uh, electric drill, and use some very, very fine sandpaper to sand off the uh, layer of old dead rubber. Don't get too carried away though, but contrary to what people will tell you, the diameter of this idler wheel is not going to affect speed any. What affects speed is the uh, stepped motor capstan. And of course, if you take too much rubber off, it's not going to have any enough grip between the the uh, platter and the motor shaft, but it won't affect speed. Well, we're just going to try the rubber renew and see what that'll do for it. Now, a lot of times these wheels will have a dent in the rubber, and that's because the record player was left in gear for an extended period of time and not being used. When it's not being used, you should keep the speed lever in neutral position. And if it doesn't have a dedicated neutral position, usually you can just set the lever between 33 and 45, and that'll disengage the wheel. I have seen these, if the dent wasn't too deep, I could use the drill and sandpaper trick to, uh, to, to correct for that. But generally, I really need to send this in and have it rebuilt with fresh rubber, but that's about 30 bucks plus shipping, and I don't really want to do that right now. Alright, I gave it the rubber renew treatment. You can see some layer of rubber come off of it. I also put a little bit of lube plate on the idler wheel shaft. And now I'll put it back onto the shaft and make sure it's oriented properly to make proper contact with the motor capstan. Then we'll put the washers on top of it, put the clip back on, and then put the platter on and give it a test run. Alright, we got the clip back on. It was a little tedious. It flew off one time. Fortunately, I found it. But it turns nice and freely now, and now we'll put the platter back on and see if it works. Alright, there it is in neutral. You can see it spins really well, so we got the center bearing lubricated good. There it is on 78. It's a little noisy because of that old hard rubber on the wheel. Now we check for torque. I should be able to pretty firmly put my finger against the edge of the platter and it not stop. If I just barely put my finger on the edge of the platter and it stops, then that means you've either got a bad idler wheel or more likely you've got some grease on one of the driving surfaces. There it is on 16 and hadn't got a lot of torque there, but 
and that wheel's obviously got a little dent in it. I can hear a little thumping noise. All right, I got a special treat for y'all. I found some mumble rap records at the uh, at the thrift store the other day. <laughs> And this is White Girl by E-40. Bundle in the bushes, chopper up in the tree. K, light up your chest like E-C. White girl, white girl, white girl, white girl, white girl, white girl. And the other side is just effing, so I can get on Mari Povich. I guess you got a mean though game in your food, you serious. Ah. Oh, kid, I got to on your pants. Now, we ain't in love, but we can dance or pretend. We get a sack of that, sack of that, a bottle of Hennessy. Check it to a 